हाँ जी भाई भाई आपने लाइव देख नहीं रहे क्या यूट्यूब क्या कर तो लिया सब कुछ पता नहीं क्या चाहिए इनको भाई सब रेडी है और मेरे को सिर्फ फेड करके वो फेंकना है वहां पे बस और कुछ नहीं करना है सब आप एक बार यूट्यूब चेक करके मुझे कॉल करो हाँ हाँ आप प्लीज सर I think mute yourself. Namaskar, madam. Namaskar, Professor Minalji. Namaskar. <laughs> नमस्कार 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 गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग यू आर नॉट विजिबल आई एम सो सॉरी नो इट्स ओके माय कैमरा इज ऑफ आई नो आई नो आई नो गुड मॉर्निंग प्रोफेसर मीनल गुड मॉर्निंग भास्कर जी गुड मॉर्निंग कोलिग्स नमस्कार सुजाता मैडम कॉन्ग्रेचुलेशन फॉर दिस डे टू यू एंड डिसिप्लिन यू आर ऑल पार्ट ऑफ दिस आई एम रिमाइंडेड ऑफ द मूवी विच केम आउट ऑफ टू इयर्स अगो विच वी सॉ Even now there All is a right. video. Uh, okay. I'll just share. Okay. Okay. A lot of my learning came from that movie. I mean, we know yeah. broadly, yeah. but we yeah. didn't yeah. know the details. Yeah. Sabhi ko namaskar. 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 Namaste. Namaskar. 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 नमस्कार मैम 
नमस्कार 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 राजेश जी नमस्कार नमस्कार अच्छा ठीक है तो आपको ना मैं जस्ट टेन ओ क्लॉक का भी कितना टाइम नमस्कार प्रोफेसर भास्कर जी नमस्कार मैडम कैसे हैं आप बस चल रहा है ऊपर वाले की कृपा उसी की कृपा होनी चाहिए <laughs> और कौशल जी मॉर्निंग राजेश जी मॉर्निंग नमस्कार 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 जी गुड मॉर्निंग मैडम गुड मॉर्निंग रेखा मैडम हाउ आर यू मतलब नमस्ते भास्कर जी सही है थोड़ा सा कैमरा में इशू हो रहा है अभी ठीक कर रहे हो जाएगा Kind permission can we start? मुझे लग रहा कनेक्टिविटी प्रॉब्लम है ना? I think uh, uh, it's ten o'clock now. Let us start. Sir uh, might be busy somewhere. He has joined. Ah, uh, sir is joined. Sir is joined. Yes. So ah. Uh, so i start uh, this uh, event uh, organized by school of sciences on national mathematics day good morning and namaskar to all of you respected honorable professor nageshwar rao sir honorable vice chancellor ignu pro vice chancellors of ignu professor satyakam professor uh, uma kanjilal ma'am professor uh, sumitra kukreti madam अम्बेडकर यूनिवर्सिटी डेली एंड प्रोफेसर कनट विश्वास फ्रॉम आई आई टी डेली ऑल द डायरेक्टर्स ऑफिसर्स फ्रॉम रीजनल सेंटर्स रजिस्ट्रार्स हेड ऑफ डिविजन फैकल्टी मेंबर्स इग्नो फ्रेटर्निटी my colleagues and dear students i extend a very warm hearty welcome to all of you indeed it is really a great privilege for me to welcome you all to the webinar on national mathematics day to commemorate all the directors officers from regional centers sri raman uh, shri nivasa ramanujam it is organized by school of sciences today at the outset i express my deep sense of gratitude to our honorable vice chancellor sir for kindly agreeing to grace this webinar in spite of his extremely busy schedule today uh, sir has always uh, been um, he has always guided and motivated and supported and encouraged us in all our endeavors and under his able guidance the university has received highest nac accreditation a++ on behalf of school of sciences i very warmly welcome you sir and we are delighted and overwhelmed to warmly welcome our speakers of today's event professor geeta uh, venkatraman from uh, ambedkar university and professor kanad vishwas from iit delhi thank you so much for kindly agreeing to have consented uh, to share your vast knowledge and experience with us today in spite of your other en engagements on very interesting topics redefining role of mathematics in context of nep 2020 and the mathematics of machine learning and deep learning i extend to a hearty welcome to all the guests who have joined today 
and this uh, webinar is being streamed live on Facebook and YouTube. A little about the school. Uh, school offers higher education in science in eight disciplines, biochemistry, chemistry, geography, geology, life science, physics, mathematics, and statistics. And we offer uh, academic programs right from awareness, certificate, diploma, undergraduate, postgraduate levels in distance mode and research in regular mode. I feel uh, immense pleasure to share that in last one year, the school has launched eight new MSc programs and one PG diploma program. School has initiated, uh, school has also initiated the launch of BSc multidisciplinary under FIUP with seven disciplines, BSc major and uh, BSc honors biochemistry under FIUP. School is also offering mathematics, chemistry, physics, geography courses in uh, BSc applied skills in Agnivir scheme. Presently, mathematics discipline has already initiated the process of launching four <laughs> Your UG program in mathematics under FYUP scheme on the guidelines of CCFUP. Uh, following the successful launch of four-year BSc honors program, now the discipline is planning to launch one year and two years master's program for students who have undergone three and four-year undergraduate program. Uh, um, uh, mathematics discipline is, uh, has, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. is offering um, um, MSc in mathematics with the uh, computer applications and uh, the fa and the faculty of School of Science has successfully completed many projects funded by government agencies like DST, SERP, UGC, CSIR, DBT, BRNS and uh, their uh, research outputs are published in high impact national in and international journals. During the last one year, Faculty has published 116 research papers, which includes 93 papers in peer-reviewed journals. And uh, lastly, it is a matter for pride and honor for me to share with you all that the school has received Best School Award on 38th Foundation Day of the University. Now, with this brief uh, uh, introduction of the school, I humbly request and uh, welcome our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to please bless us with his kind and inspiring words. Thank you. Uh, can I just start with a sloka? Ye yes, ma'am, please. Please, please. Yatha shikha mayuranam, like the crust of the peacock, naganam manayotatha, like the gem on the head of a snake, tatvat vedanga shastranam ganidam, so, is the mathematics at the head of all knowledge? Happy this. Welcome all in our honorable center, all the distinguished guests, our experts, faculty, colleagues, and friends. Happy day, National Mathematics Day, sir. I humbly request Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to please bless us with his kind words. VC, sir, please. First of all, I and the entire fraternity of IGLO is celebrating the 36th great in Srinivas. And this occasion, it is being celebrated Mathematics Day. The school implement it is this day for the last so many years and there is tremendous progress as far as the discipline of mathematics is concerned i welcome geeta venkatraman and also professor Kanad Vishwas, who spared their valuable time for us to enlighten us, was in so that the school can forward 
in its endeavors. Professor Gita Venkat, now they are into the role of politics in the context of twenty. The role redefined the national and its relevant context. Professor Khan has moved ahead on machine learning. That the school has has given description with respect to the national education policy under, and we are going to launch January. Twenty-four. Uh, this particular, day, I do feel, it is the mother discipline of all the disciplines, but also in the prior. It is the paper of mathematics we all are supposed to study, and even when we have to appear in a and in a selection, it's everywhere the importance of mathematics. Even the or the computer science, where the students they want to move ahead. The math is an important discipline which needs to be understood, and that is why we see that area in ten plus two with mathematics, and that is why it signifies how math special for the contribution of Srinivasan ji, and we find that charted the path. In compassing the entire education system, so to show that even in the light of national education policy, you see that she has lots of changes. Respect country education, teach mathematics, and there in the. Have the tables. We have the numbers. Use the number that becomes very, very prominent. Even from the basic disciplines of their mind math. So that signifies relevance and importance. And talking about. Education system, ability. There also this particular discipline it helps us to how the input to strengthen our knowledge. Uh, we know that the mathematics, along with the school of sciences, they are coming up in a big way. And during the last one year, they could have the eight PG programs. In the School of Sciences, they are working hard, and as Meenal Ji has rightly pointed out, in the recent day, on the eve of Foundation Day, this particular school awarded the best in terms of this they have carried one P. All proud achievements. We all proud of learning process, but also in terms of contribution. Healthy contribution. We know that we learners the basic this the science not an easy task. That is why exert a lot. That how a distant learner reading the material material is being self learning mode. 
self instructional material the four side uh, visualization of a learner and here we see they are distinct learners advanced learners in an university where we see the conversation there we very individual student deciding factor for the eligibility therefore the variations in terms of capacity is the least but it, we have to cost of the country globe that the capability and the accessibility difficult but an easy task and per, and to distance that is mean this faculty this specially deserves for efforts to cause of action the two thing for faculty there is free them there exist and with that they can also see those study material can be made much more the learners be much more employable the materials which have been prepared out in other applied disciplines here my course contents the delivery of the Creating the thematic stay, to feel remembering the who about the method. Know that we are writing method. We have to see that analysis also help us to build the base in. Uh, higher education, I even the school, and also welcome our guests who will be present. Uh, work viewpoints, uh, lecture. Get from them that will definitely be you curriculum design. Develop, develop in the curriculum. This and undergraduate and postgraduate uh, school of sciences. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, kind words and to enlighten us. So I welcome all you once again on this National Mathematics Day. As we all know that. Ramanujan was a great mathematician. Uh, unfortunately, he died very uh, early, in the age of 32 years. But in that very short span of time, he contributed a lot to mathematics. People are still trying to understand his work, and major research is going on uh, his contributions because uh, the way he thought was quite uh, extraordinary but uh, not uh, the modern day approach in modern day we think rigorously logically but his approach was quite distinct and people are still trying to understand uh, trying to prove many of his unproved theorems so on this day uh, we are remembering national uh, that uh, great mathematician ramanujan and uh, in this context uh, our theme is for uh, today's uh, celebration mathematics and its relevance for society and industry so in this context we have uh, invited two eminent experts namely professor geeta venkatraman from dr b r medical university delhi and professor uh, tanad biswas uh, who is retired from iit delhi so let me just talk about brief about uh, the ex uh, experts Professor Geeta Venkatraman uh, did her Doctor of Philosophy 
uh, from University of Oxford. And she also did from the same university her BA honors in mathematics, uh, which was uh, on those days equivalent to a master's degree. Her research area is finite group theory. She has been working as professor of mathematics uh, in the School of Liberal Studies, Dr. B. R. American University, uh, from August uh, 2010 onwards. Before that, she has been working in St. Stephen's College as associate professor. And uh, she has also been associate coordinator of mathematics for two years in the Institute, uh, Institute of Lifelong Learning, University of Delhi. Her research publications uh, are quite, uh, has, she has uh, published a great number of uh, articles in different uh, reputed journals. She has delivered, uh, delivered uh, more than 40 talks on different topics in conferences and uh, seminars. She has published many research monographs uh, and textbooks. Her textbook, A Bridge to Mathematics, under Sage publication, is uh, quite popular among uh, UG students. And apart from this, she also has a very a deeply interested in popularizing mathematics and mathematics education and issues related to women in mathematics. She, uh, in fact, she has been an executive committee member of the organization Indian Women and in Mathematics, which is an organization sponsored by National Board of Higher Mathematics. She has been on the organizing committees of numerous national and international conferences and she has been on the editorial board of many reputed journals uh, like uh, Little Mathematical Treasures of Ramanujan Mathematical Society. So she is one of the uh, uh, editor for this uh, journal. And apart from this, uh, her uh, hobbies, I just talked about one of her very interesting hobbies. She is a bird lover and a fine photographer. I was just looking at her uh, some of the pictures she has captured on, and all those pictures are available on our website. Her CV is quite long, and a lot of things are there, but uh, I could only uh, talk very, uh, uh, because in the short span of time, we cannot uh, talk uh, all the points. So now I just uh, 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 read the CV of Professor Kanad Biswas. Uh, Professor Tanat Viswas did his B.Tech in Electrical Engineering from IIT Madras in 1968. And then he did M.Tech in Control Systems and Ph.D. in Signal Estimation from IIT Delhi in 1974. After a brief stint at the University of Roorkee, he joined the Electronics and Engineering Department of IIT Delhi. And later, shifted to the Department of Computer Science and Engineering of the same college. So in IIT Delhi, he has a long career, more than 40 years. After retiring from IIT Delhi, he has been uh, associated with uh, IIIT Delhi for a year. And after that, he also is associated to the Bennett University of Times Group at Greater Noida. He has been a visiting professor at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, and at the University of Central Florida, USA. He has also acted as, uh, as UNESCO expert for development of curriculum at University of Nigeria. He has been collaborating with University of Oxford and University of Texas at Austin on various research projects in the areas of uh, robotics, artificial intelligence, graphical simulation, and many other. He has been on an active researcher with more than 20 PhD students under his guidance and more than 100 publications in reputed journals and international uh, conferences. His current research uh, interests are image and video processing, deep learning with applications in human activity recognition, and disease identification of agricultural crops. So welcome you, sir, to this uh, uh, national uh, webinar. 
So I uh, once again welcome both the experts and all the IGNU fraternity uh, on this National Mathematics Day. So now it is uh, Professor Geeta Venkatraman. She will uh, talk about redefining the role of mathematics in the context of NEP 2020. Uh, Professor Geeta Venkatraman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pawan Kumar, for such a generous introduction. Uh, is it all right for me to share my uh, presentation now? Yeah. Yes, yes ma'am. Ma hmm? uh, can everyone see my presentation? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank IGNU for inviting me to uh, or to give a talk on this occasion. And, uh, uh, you know, I have been involved many times with many things in IGNU and have uh, seen the high standards that all of you uh, keep to and put in. Uh, particularly, uh, I have uh, memories of moderating mathematics uh, papers sometimes and uh, the meticulousness with which uh, the questions were looked at and uh, you know there were these grids which we had to um, ensure that they fell in and uh, we were not uh, you know the questions were uh, of the sort where the candidate had to think and uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, could I uh, request everybody to please switch on the switch off their mics? Yeah, thank you. So, um, so I've had uh, very very nice memories and experiences of uh, actually being in Ignu in Maidangari, and uh, I also have another connection with Ignu. My father actually worked there in the very early days. Uh, when um, the computer center was uh, still functioning out of uh, horse cars. So uh, my father who had been working in the Indian Air Force had uh, taken a premature retirement and had uh, been part of the initial uh, setting up of the computer division uh, in, in Inknu. So I'm very, very pleased to be here with, with all of you. And uh, of course, today is uh, the 136th anniversary of uh, Srinivasa Ramanujan's birth. And uh, I'm so pleased to be able to uh, be part of the National Mathematics Day celebration. Um, before I actually start on the topic, uh, which is redefining the role of mathematics in the context of NEP 2020, I wanted to mention uh, another uh, fact, which uh, which actually allowed me to uh, delve much deeper into Srinivasa Ramanujan's life and work. This was the period that I had spent in IEEL, Institute of Lifelong Learning in uh, the University of Delhi. And uh, at that time, the maths team was... Uh, trying to create e-learning material for uh, to support uh, mathematics courses which were already running in the uh, in uh, Delhi University and the, one of these courses was a course called mathematical awareness it was meant for non mathematics students but we often felt that it should have been opened also for the mathematics students because uh, you know with the regular kind of maths curriculum uh, Vinita ji, please aap apna uh, mic mute kar lenge. Yeah. So with the, uh, with the, uh, you know, with the current, with the kind of maths curriculum that uh, math students in the past uh, have studied, uh, often it's very, very focused towards core mathematics and uh, even, um, you know, uh, the knowledge of what went, what mathematics had to go through to reach the current stage 
was something that people were not very aware of. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to introduce biographies of, of mathematicians. And uh, I had the fortune of working on two stalwarts, uh, Emmy Neuther, who's very dear to my heart, being a woman mathematician. And in fact, uh, one of the first women mathematicians of repute who was uh, considered uh, foremost across the world. And of course, Sridivasa Ramanujan. Um, so th the work that I did allowed me to, you know, uh, write a very long essay on Ramanujan. It was a pictorial biography. Of course, we concentrated mainly on uh, aspects from his life rather than the mathematical work, because this was something that was to be accessible to non-math students. So I want to also uh, start my lecture with a very, very small, uh, quick um, take on uh, Ramanujan's life, uh, because I feel that it would be, uh, it would not be uh, correct on his birth date and on National Mathematics Day not to speak about him. So I will initially start with that and then uh, move on to uh, the issue that is, uh, uh, you know, something uh, that's close to all our hearts because we are all in the process of, uh, you know, uh, redefining our mathematics curriculum um, to make it more meaningful, particularly in the context of NEP 2020. So with that, I will, I will start with my uh, presentation. And in case uh, anyone has any queries, um, you can uh, please uh, interrupt me and ask me questions. I will welcome that. Uh, let me, yeah. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to start with, uh, with uh, Ramanujan. Um, and you can already see that I've inset his photograph in, uh, what seems to be uh, quite a bit of mathematics around his portrait. It's in fact uh, mathematics written in Ramanujan's own writing. Um, he had these notebooks and uh, uh, we are very, very fortunate that uh, uh, you can access uh, these, the digitized version of these notebooks uh, the Institute of Math Science in Chennai has a repository and uh, uh, some of these, uh, so this page, for example, I have taken from there. So, uh, but I would urge you to actually go and look at uh, Ramanujan, uh, see his work, see the, uh, you know, the meticulous way in which he wrote uh, you can hardly see a line scratched out in those notebooks. But let's start with, uh, with uh, Ramanujan's birth. So he was actually born in Erode on 22nd December 1887 at his maternal grandfather's home. Uh, it was customary within his, the, the community that he came from for the mother to go to her maternal home to have her child. And um, his, uh, his uh, parents used to live in Kumbakonam uh, in 17 Sarangapani Sannidhi Street. So this is actually a picture of his house uh, where uh, Srinivasa Ramanujan used to live. And it's, uh, it's been preserved and people can go and visit. Uh, and in fact... Uh, Many of the number theorists from across the world, when they come to conferences in India, uh, particularly the ones who've been studying Ramanujan's work for a very long time, and as mentioned by Dr. Pavan Kumar, people are still trying to understand how he even came up with his ideas. But uh, many of them, uh, for many of them, it's a pilgrimage to, to go to uh, Kumbakonam to see where uh, uh, Ramanujan grew up and this would be the the veranda in which he sat with his slate uh, you know doing his uh, mathematics so um, 
he lived in fact in this place till uh, his departure to 1905 because this talk is primarily not on ramanujan i'm i'm uh, sort of only picking out highlights but what i wanted to say is that when he was very little uh, he did not really speak very much and people were very worried about uh, you know whether he would um you know actually talk i think uh, the, the uh, up to almost 4 years he barely spoke but his mother who was a staunch uh, um their family deity was uh, namagiri and um, so sh she um had a a dream in which the goddess appeared and said that her son would do extremely well and uh, also uh, you know uh, the there is a, a ceremony that you go through called the akshara abhyas and uh, so you know uh, ramanujan's finger was taken and when he was little to write uh, you know the tamil letters in rice and um, subsequently of course we all know um, how well he did so uh, he studied in uh, kumbakonam he studied in kangayan uh, primary school in kumbakonam and in fact he did extremely well in his primary school examinations this is actually a certificate his certificate his primary school certificate he stood first in the district and the examinations in the primary school um, were in uh, the the subjects were english tamil arithmetic and geography and then he joined the town high school where the medium of instruction was english this is a picture of the high school from a decade or so ago and he actually did quite well even then in in school he uh, he his school leaving record is excellent and he um, you know uh, passed with flying colors but there was something that had happened to him full time which had uh, a lot of consequences so um, so there's this uh, book by car that he came across so in 1903 just before he graduated from town high school ramanujan was given a book titled a synopsis of elementary results in pure and applied mathematics the book was written by george shubridge car and this book consisted of 6165 theorems and uh, topics like algebra trigonometry calculus and analytic geometry were among other topics which were covered by these theorems uh, car published this two volume set in 1880 and 1886 respectively as a coaching manual primarily for students who were doing the tripos examination at the university of cambridge so this was something uh, the book itself had almost no mathematical proofs but the results were laid out in a logical sequence so that you know if you kept solving the results as they appeared you could use one to solve the next and so on so here's a picture of the of the of a page from the book and you can see that they're just numbered and they're just results and this would have a sort of profound influence on ramanujan for him it was like you know um, being let loose into a candy store uh, he was let loose into a, a book which had so much of maths which could be which he could think about and uh, convince himself that these results were true but this was the style that ramanujan ended up adopting when he himself recorded results in his notebook so um as i said he did extremely well in school and then he went on to uh, join college in chennai and um by then he was so deeply involved in mathematics um it was almost like uh, you know uh, in the in the past uh, ages past we hear of rishis who went and meditated in the hills till ant hills covered him them 
So Ramanujan, uh, I think, meditated mathematics and he was really not bothered about anything else. And, uh, and that's uh, something that you can survive when you, when you come to college. And, I, and at, at some level, um, our system, um, even now, will not encourage someone like Ramanujan because we do, Ramanujan, though, was a genius. I mean, we don't make too many, we don't have too many people like him, but uh, it would also be nice if our systems could be, um, could have flexibility so that a person, uh, a genius like him could also come through our system. However, I mean, with Ramanujam, everybody knows that he, he uh, did not manage to uh, finish his degree. He, he was just so busily involved with his mathematics. And he then tried teaching tuitions. Um, but he always got deeply involved in the mathematics. And the, the school, uh, middle school students did not, uh, you know, in fact, suffered from his uh, overzealousness for, for mathematics. And uh, so since he didn't seem to be, uh, you know, doing... Um, uh, as far as the family was concerned, they were not very well to do. They needed the money that Ramanujan was getting in scholarship when he was in college. And since he was not even successful with tuitions, they felt that maybe he should have more responsibility and then he would settle down and do more, uh, you know, proper work. Uh, with that in mind, uh, they, he was... Uh, married to Janaki Amal in 1909. She was just 10 years old at that point. Uh, those days, child marriage was uh, prevalent. And uh, But uh, uh, soon after that, uh, Ramanujan um, uh, tried to find people who would appreciate his mathematics. He'd already started recording them in notebooks. And uh, he started working in the Madras Port Trust. And so while he was working in the Madras Port Trust and still doing his mathematics, he had some very supportive employers there. Um, and they felt that he should try and communicate his mathematics to mathematicians abroad. His first paper had already got published in the Indian Maths Journal. And um, so Ramanujan wrote to several people in, in the UK but uh, he did not get any response. Then in 1913, on the 16th of January, Ramanujan set in, into motion events that changed his life forever. He wrote yet another letter. It's, this was addressed to the Cambridge mathematician G.H. Hardy, who was then uh, 35 years of age and was already recognized as a mathematician to be reckoned with. Uh, I'll just say a tiny bit about G.H. Hardy. He was someone who, who pulled British mathematics and mathematics across the world into the, um, into the 20th century, I would say, because he was someone who was very, very insistent on proofs. And so in, in, in a sense, G.H. Hardy was this person who, uh, for whom, uh, you know, uh, mathematics needed to be pure. He was, uh, he looked down on applications of mathematics and certainly did not want to have anything to do with um, mathematics. Uh, unfortunately for him, his mathematics uh, subsequently has been applied in many directions. But, uh, but at that time, you, you have to imagine this uh, bachelor who, who was steeped in you know the culture of the University of Cambridge who who uh, you know wanted uh, proofs for everything in mathematics so Hardy receives this letter from Ramanujan uh, where it says dear sir I beg to introduce myself to you as a clerk in the dot 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 and so began the letter that Ramanujan wrote to Hardy and in fact this uh, Excerpt that I put here is actually uh, 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 an excerpt from his letter. And uh, so this is how it starts. He's giving this background that he's not really finished his university education, but he's been 
doing uh, mathematics and he's striking a new path and he's got all these extraordinary results. So here are some pictures of G.H. Hardy and his book, A Mathematician's Apology, is something that I would recommend to everyone um, to read. Um, so when Hardy rece receives this letter, it's breakfast time in his and he's in Trinity College, Cambridge. He's bored and irritated because this is, he feels that this is yet another bizarre letter sent by a stranger. Some of the results quoted in the letter were clearly wrong. Some were already very well-known results that Ramanujan was claiming for himself, and yet others were baffling to say the least. So um, the worst was the fact that there were no proofs. Not finding proofs was reason enough for being dismissive of the letter, yet Hardy could not bring himself to do so. So what does he do? He um, So he's stuck with this letter and he's thinking, should I dismiss it? But there are all these strange results in it. So he seeks the help of his friend Littlewood in trying to decide on the fate of the letter. So Littlewood and Hardy sit down and start trying to prove some of the new results that are quoted in that letter and you know they as they work more and more they are convinced that yes that those are correct there are lots of things here which are correct but they some of it they just can't figure out how to even prove so after about three hours of deliberation from 9 p.m till midnight they concluded that this letter was not that of a crank and the main reason, according to Hardy, was because great mathematicians are commoner than thieves or humbugs of such incredible skill. So then, uh, of course, uh, Hardy uh, is very excited that he's discovered this new possible genius. And they get in touch. They're writing letters to each other. Uh, he wants Ramanujan to come to England to... to uh, be at Trinity College and to, to study, to do mathematics with Hadi. But of course, uh, Ramanujan comes from uh, a very orthodox Brahmin family. And uh, in those days, um, if you traveled across the seas, if you crossed and went out of the land which was considered your motherland, uh, you lost your identity. Um, so it was very difficult for Ramanujan to take that step to go abroad. Um, uh, but eventually, um, again, um, he meditates at the, at the local, at the, at the place, the shrine of the family deity. And, um, and there is a dream that he gets uh, where the deity is asking him to proceed to, to, uh, to England. And uh, so in uh, 1914, in April, so this is uh, a little over a year since he's made contact with, uh, with Hardy, he reaches, he's formally to study for a BA degree by research at Trinity College, Cambridge. So this is Trinity College, Cambridge. And you have to imagine uh, a young man uh, who's grown up in a small town, Kumbakonam, in a street which is uh, next to a temple. And uh, the maximum foray he's had is Chennai, where he's lived for some time working at the Port Trust. And he's traveled by ship. He's not someone who was familiar with Western clothing or with shoes. And he's reached Trinity College, uh, which is, um, you know, um, a kind of jewel in the crown within the university. Cambridge. And these are the weevil courts uh, in uh, Trinity College where he lives. And he's often seen crossing the great court in Trinity College, a solitary figure in slippers, as shoes were still alien, um, bound for uh, Hardy's rooms. In June, uh, Ramanujan moved into weevil court uh, in uh, uh, Trinity College. And uh, Hardy was able to see all the notebooks and listen to Ramanujan's reasoning behind his theorems. Hardy found the notebooks amazing and he felt that about two thirds of the results in the notebooks were breathtakingly new. 
so basically hardy and ramanujan start working on the on the maths uh, ramanuj uh, hardy is trying to inculcate into ramanujan the idea of proof uh, for ramanujan if he had an intuition and he could convince himself that that result was true uh, he for him the result was done and uh, it's basically during this period in cambridge that he realizes that he has to uh, provide a logical sequence of uh, statements which actually prove the result and which could be tested and looked at by peers from anywhere in the world and they would know that this result was true so that's something that he learned in in cambridge but however i mean ramanujan was a vegetarian um getting vegetarian food those days in england was very tough hardy mentored ramanujan very well mathematically he was a hard task master and kept ramanujan focused on mathematics and this suited ramanujan also who ideally would have liked to give up on everything else including eating breathing and uh, probably would have just been happy to do mathematics but obviously such something like this tells on your health because he was in an alien setting the warriors uh, the first world war uh, was um, you know beginning around that point um, the warriors had further depleted access to good vegetarian food he also ramanujan also forsook any physical activity apart from a sedentary stroll and he would stay up all hours working on his mathematics and sometimes cooked only every other day there were no checks and balances as would have been applied by his family and friends back home in india and the result was that he fell very very ill um the so by 1917 ramanujan so this is within a three year period of being in england he had fallen ill and was being treated for tuberculosis at a sanatorium in england he was also quite um, you know down and out because of his health the fact that he was not close to his family and this was really a, a quite a bad period for him but then he hears about the fact that he uh, had got elected to a fellowship at trinity college and and also the royal society and it brought back some cheer into his life um and he had uh, moved from matlock to a hospital in central london by then however the great war uh, ended in november 1918 and hardy felt that ramanujan should at least temporarily return to india so that he could uh, be nursed back to health so ramanujan leaves for india and uh, reaches india on 27th of march 1919 but he was not the same man who left for england a few years ago uh, to quote a friend of ramanujan who received visited ramanujan a few year, months later he was just a bundle of bones lying on the cot he'd also changed in his temperament he was no longer the jovial friendly ramanujan constantly cracking jokes his temper seemed to be on a quick trigger and he had periods of sullen silence the silver lining was that he found some joy in his relationship with his wife janaki she was now 18 and no longer the child he had married she nursed him through his deteriorating health um his mathematical work however continued unabated he continued to work whenever he was able to indeed by his wife's account even 4 days before his death he was furiously writing mathematics almost as if he had to put it down on paper his thoughts before uh, his spirit gave up the struggle and finally on 26th april 1920 uh, ramanujan passed away in the short span of 32 years 4 months and 4 days ramanujan dazzled the mathematical world with his seemingly inexplicable hold on numbers equations and certain parts of mathematics when ramanujan returned in 1919 the nationalist movement in india was beginning and ramanujan was seen as a role model an indian who shone the world
that Indians were more than equal to the best in the world. His impact on the mathematical world continues even now. So there are, um, as uh, Dr. Pankaj said, there are people, mathematicians, who are still working on uh, the results which have been mentioned in his notebook for which uh, the proofs were not there. They're working on the proofs. People are also working on trying to figure out how he might have thought about these ideas. So in maths, often you're looking, you're, you know, you're recognizing patterns, you're intuitively getting a feel for the mathematics in that area. And it's only through all of that and a lot of struggle and going down wrong paths, do you come to deciding what the result should be. Um, so it doesn't appear you know, well done and well packaged like uh, the way in which we, uh, you know, prove results for our students. So uh, a lot of work is also going on in trying to understand how Ramanujan may have, uh, you know, come to those uh, equations and results that he put out in his notebooks. And in the words of the mathematician Ken Ono, just a crude look at the list of mathematical entities that bear his name would tell their own story. The following are a few examples. The Dougal Ramanujan identity, the Landau Ramanujan constant, Ramanujan's theta function, Ramanujan's tau function, Ramanujan's class invariance, Rogers Ramanujan identities, and Ramanujan's mock theta function. Uh, since this talk is not on Ramanujan, I'm uh, not uh, going to focus at all on his work, but I hope I've said enough that people feel inclined to find out more about Ramanujan's uh, mathematical work as well. In fact, if you look at his early notebooks, there are beautiful results on magic squares and, of course, on partitions, identities about partitions and so on. So those are, um, you know, things that can be accessible to a larger audience. Um, when Janaki was 80 year old, um, they, she lamented in an interview about the lack of a statue of Ramanujan and this spurred mathematicians into action. 62 years after Ramanujan's death, mathematicians from all over the world under the initiative of the mathematician Richard Askey. Askey in particular has often written about you know, what could have led to Ra the, the insight with which Ramanujan probably came to a particular result, whether it was on continued fractions or other identities. So Richard Askey collected money to commission several busts of Ramanujan from the sculptor Paul Grandlund. Amongst those who contributed was the Nobel Prize winner and physicist Subramanyam Chandrasekhar. He had in fact procured the photo of Ramanujan that is familiar to the world from Janaki several decades earlier. That two-dimensional photo, it was a photo taken for the passport, was uh, the basis for the bust that Granlund made. One bust was presented to Janaki and had the pride of place on a pedestal in Janaki's simple home in Chennai. And Janaki Amal herself died on 13th April 1994 at the age of 94. And this is a bust of Ramanujan that was made by Paul Granlund. So with this, I um, have, I hope I've given you a glimpse of this marvelous genius who did such wonderful mathematics that even now when um, there are new parts of modern mathematics that are being done, suddenly people realize that, oh, this has connection with something that Ramanujan did um, ages ago and that if you generalized something that he did, this is what you would get. So his, his mathematics is extremely relevant even today for all of us. And I hope that he is an inspiration to all of us from India for, uh, for the next several decades and more. So with this, I will move on to uh, looking at mathematics in the context of NEP, how do we do we have to redefine the way in which we teach and learn mathematics? Um, 
is it just a small rejig or do we really need to have a different kind of insight or a view of how mathematics should be taught and um, so what i would actually want to think about really is that we can't separate undergraduate mathematics education from undergraduate education as a whole and uh, so let's try and see um, what we can glean from what NEP 2020 tells us. So the idea that, so the, the, a core idea in NEP 2020, of course, is the seamlessness between what should happen at the school level at the, and at the higher education level. But primarily, the idea is that through education, which should be accessible to everybody, we would be creating um, informed and uh, compassionate citizens for our country. So one on the now on the left, I'm going to show you a set of uh, phrases which we would like to associate with our students who come to us uh, to do an undergraduate degree. And so undergraduate mathematics education also has to, um, to be focused towards creating a curriculum and a way of looking at mathematics, which would inculcate many of these qualities that we require. So we want our graduates to have scientific temper. They should be able to think creatively. There should be problem solvers. Critical thinking is absolutely essential. The two terms, critical thinking and creative thinking, I mean, right now we are in a, um, a, a decade, uh, more than a decade, in fact, I would say, where we have been faced with disruptive technologies. All of us are extremely familiar with the fact that you learn how to use one particular type of phone and then it's moved, uh, you know, so much further there are so many new apps that have come and uh, the kinds of things that say we were familiar with even two or three decades ago uh, the newer generation don't even know what those are you know the, the kind of things that we had to go through so and this is going to keep happening now so what we do require is a set of students who graduate who are going to be able to cope with the dynamic way in which technology is influencing our lives and will continue to influence our lives. So we need to be able to think creatively. We need to be able to be problem solvers and we need to actually be lifelong learners. I think those are extremely important. And all these things, creative thinking, problem solving, critical thinking are all ingredients which will help us actually to be lifelong learners. Um, and if we are not that, we are going to find it extremely difficult to cope with what is uh, already there and what is soon to come. Uh, of course, the students who graduate need to be employable. They should be capable of rational thinking, caring. Um, they should be very clear on ethical dimensions. So these are all things that uh, NEP articulates as part of undergraduate education. And so undergraduate mathematics education also has to um, have a, a, a set of things which could help students gain or gain training as far as possible in all of these things. So what should be there as part of undergraduate mathematics education? And of course, we cannot, the, the, one of the core things that undergraduate mathematics education has to do is also to produce mathematicians. Because if we do not have that loop continuing, then uh, we can say goodbye to mathematics completely. So um, we do need to have a curriculum which is also going to produce mathematicians. At its core, therefore, there has to be mathematics. But we need all of these other things which are also mentioned in NEP 2020. 
uh, our curriculum needs to be multidisciplinary. There has to be flexibility. Uh, students have to learn about ethics. There has to be a holistic education, which not only looks at the uh, intellectual dimension, but also uh, a physical and spiritual dimension. Um, you know, uh, we got our independence in 1947 and our constitution in 1950. And many of us are unfamiliar with the rights that uh, the, our constitution confers on us. And it's a constitution that we can be proud of. And it's really important that I think the current generation is also familiar with what the Indian constitution is about. Human values, pride in India, rootedness. Uh, you know, one of the things that has always occurred to me, I was someone when I did mathematics, I did not want to do anything other than mathematics. I, I would have, in, in that sense, I would have been... Uh, somewhat happy to follow in uh, Ramanujan's footsteps, uh, not at the level of his genius, but in terms of, you know, wanting to do only mathematics. But when you come back, and even if you have a career in mathematics, you realize that uh, you need to know so much more, particularly if you've done administration, um, an, an understanding of society, of people, is extremely important and unfortunately uh, focusing only on mathematics doesn't give you that insight so uh, the the idea is that the curriculum um, should expose students to also ideas from arts and humanities and of course technology no one can um, survive in the modern world now without uh, having uh, an not just access to technology, but also uh, learning on how to handle it and to be able to learn new and more and more newer technologies. And of course, skills. Um, you know, we would expect that all our students have uh, access to being able to interpret and uh, uh, analyze data. They need to have computational literacy. Um, and also skills which may be practical, you know. Uh, all we, we tend to treat students in a very homogeneous way, but each student is different, learns differently, likes different things, and somehow we have to take care of uh, the kind of um, uh, persons that they are when they come to the undergraduate level. And we want them to go away from uh, the three years, which are extremely character forming. And they're the, the most important years, I would say, of their adult life to, um, to you know, have a good experience and to take away many of the things that we want them to take away from our undergraduate education. Um, I always feel that undergraduate education is the key to so many things. Uh, it's, the, it's the key way in which we create our informed or we, we create uh, an environment which can produce informed citizens. And most importantly, our school teachers come from there. Um, so I, in, I would want the undergraduate experience in particular for every single student to be one where they have access, there's equity, they can get quality education out of it because our society as a whole uh, depends on the kinds of students that we graduate from our undergraduate program. But how have we been looking at mathematics uh, curriculum in the past? So how did we approach it in the past? So let's take a look at, I mean, this is my view, but I'm sure many of you would agree with this. So let's look at what we did with school mathematics. We had uh, mathematics largely compulsory till the 10th grade. In the 11th and 12th grade, mathematics becomes an optional subject. 
Um, the math syllabus in the 11th and 12th grade needs to serve several needs, several disciplines. So the kind of mathematics that is put into the 11th and 12th standard course is uh, the kind of mathematics which is needed as a base for many different directions. On the other side, when you look at university mathematics, it's largely been focused on creating mathematicians. So what do you need to create mathematicians? You need a PhD in mathematics. So the master's degree in mathematics, the syllabus in the master's degree in mathematics has been determined by what is needed for um, students who graduate from the master's in mathematics to go towards a PhD in mathematics. So you can see uh, these two, uh, uh, you can think of it as two uh, shores of a river. On the one side is what students have learned in their 11th, 12th standard. And on the other side is the kind of syllabus that you need in masters in mathematics. And so what does what happened to undergraduate mathematics was that it just became a I wouldn't even say a bridge it just became this large cauldron into which you we threw in everything that a student who hadn't who needed to do a master's in maths had to learn you know after doing maths at the school level so the result really is that the syllabus for undergraduate mathematics became a gap filler between what somebody did in the 12th grade and what someone would do in the masters. So we did not really think of undergraduate mathematics education as part or holistically in terms of undergraduate education. And I think that uh, is a fault which um, is something that uh, was probably good for those students who really enjoyed mathematics uh, when they came to do mathematics at the university level and wanted to continue with mathematics at the higher level. But in general, less than 25% of the undergraduate students continue studying mathematics at a higher level. Even smaller percentage will go on to uh, do a PhD in mathematics and even a smaller percentage of that will continue to uh, become, uh, to choose mathematics as a career and become mathematicians. So, so you can see the kind of injustice that we were doing to, uh, by creating a curriculum which was primarily designed only to create mathematicians. Uh, the 75% or more of the students who came in at the undergraduate level to do a, a, a degree in mathematics, um, a sort of terminal degree in mathematics, went away uh, not necessarily experiencing the best that mathematics could offer. So um, how can we create an undergraduate mathematics curriculum that is meaningful to all? You know, you need to create citizens for the modern world. We need to have mathematicians. And most importantly, we need to have very good school teachers. So how do we create a curriculum which is going to be meaningful in all these ways? And that's where the I would see these as key steps. Of course, we need to have core and compulsory mathematics. But because we have all these other things that we wish our students to be exposed to, you would have compulsory courses providing a breadth in terms of language, knowledge about environment, social engagement, communication skills, vocational skills, a knowledge of constitution, data modeling, computational skills. I mean, see, the, there are the, the Problem is the balance that we need, but it's also extremely important that we do have a certain exposure that we give the students at the university level. We can't just say that, you know, these are things that they've done in school. They need to experience these as adults and 
otherwise we are not going to create a person who is well equipped to be a citizen in the current decade um there has to be flexibility and choice see those who so if you've done your core and compulsory bit of mathematics that everybody who does an undergraduate degree in maths uh, does and then you have these other courses which are your foundational courses their skill enhancing and and so on um you will still have more than a third of your curriculum available and that is where we really need to focus to allow those who want to continue with mathematics to have the flexibility and choice to choose higher level maths courses which would prepare them for a masters program or to move after a four year undergraduate program into a, a phd program directly but along with it you need to have also a large amount of choice so that students who do not wish to continue with mathematics but feel attracted to so many different directions that they could go into they also should have the choice to choose electives from other disciplines from other areas so that they can um ultimately head towards uh their interests which will then allow them to make career choices which are going to keep them happy through their life so this is what we have to keep in mind while we uh create our curriculum and the whole idea now is that education has to be accessible it has anywhere anytime anyhow is something that uh is is it, it's already beginning but it has come with the ability to uh you know maybe uh, uh, leave after a year but come back at some point of time later in your life and to be able to complete your program so this is it has to be our curriculum has to be learner centric there has to be continuous assessment formative and summative and uh we need to look at supportive technologies to to do all of this and um oh sorry i think this has come back again so what are our key issues and challenges because uh we have a tendency to have something theoretical and very nice on paper but when it comes to implementation uh we are we neither have the resources nor the infrastructure nor the trained faculty i suppose at one level syllabus design is something that we can focus quite easily on but again that is also theoretical if we don't have the wherewithal to implement it um we need to have a common calendar because it's often not possible for one institution to be able to provide all the choice that a learner requires and in handling the kind of quantities that we have in india uh quality often becomes uh, um, gets lost so i i can't i mean ultimately uh it's a question of how the implementation happens but we have to these are all the key issues and challenges that we will have to uh contend with when we try to implement uh, these changes in our syllabus and to kind of redefine mathematics but as mathematicians we are problem solvers and now we have a very interesting and complex set of issues to deal with and solve dynamically uh this is something that we have to remember that we will constantly have to fine tune what we find as a solution today uh, may itself become a problem tomorrow and please remember that um in the words of ingrid dubashi uh, she said that if you have a sticker which says mathematics inside and you can stick it on uh, anything which can be studied using mathematics or which has been created using mathematics you will realize that pretty much everything in our world will have a sticker with this sticker so mathematics is at the core it's very important and we as mathematicians really need to 
uh, create a very meaningful curriculum for all the students who come to do mathematics so that they go away, uh, you know, having had a wonderful set of experiences. With this, I will stop and say thank you. Thank you very much, madam, for your very clear-cut and informative talk on uh, Srinivas Ramajan's life and work and also on how mathematics uh, curriculum to be designed. So now uh, we have some question and answer session. If, you, if anyone has any queries or uh, questions, then please ask. Uh, good afternoon, madam. I have written quite a few things in the chat. Please do read. Because I think, you know, you have made such a lovely presentation. We only know the name Ramanujam. I, of course, saw this film made on him. Your talk, really, as you talked, I remembered each and every scene of the film. It all got revived. And the emotion with which you have, you know, made your point is really tremendous. I don't understand maths much. I hope in my next <laughs> birth it will happen. But tremendous, uh, this thing by you. I really love your point about gap filler. That's really a very nice way of putting it. But I was thinking perhaps it is not limited only to mathematics. And I think probably that is the problem with our entire uh, undergraduate education. You have put it very beautifully. Uh, so that I just wanted your comment on that. Yeah. No, no, I agree with you. Um, I, 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 I do agree. See, I mean, in fact, uh, I particularly experienced this uh, divide. See, in school, the way many of the things are taught uh, don't give you an insight into the subject at all. Um, and uh, for me, uh, you know, my exposure to arts and social sciences, in fact, uh, took place largely when I was at Oxford. Because even in uh, the university, when I, uh, I did my undergrad degree in St. Stephen's College, I was a BSc math student, so uh, we tended to, you know, uh, tended to be in, in the science part of the uh, college, which was separated out and did not really get exposure. We didn't have to do anything except English language as part of our uh, curriculum in, in those days. So, but the, but the problem with maths is that the divide between uh, school maths and college maths is actually, uh, it's almost like a, you know, chasm between school maths and uh, college maths. I think in other subjects that, while it's true that undergraduate education has come in as a filler, the divide between what was done in school and college is not so uh, drastic, but it's still there, you know. I, I mean, I, I, I see the... Because, see, primarily, uh, who are the people who are making the curriculum? We are all subject experts in our disciplines, right? And we have spent all our lives being within the discipline. So our tendency is to focus, therefore, on the discipline because that's where we have our expertise. But I think as I have, uh, you know, uh, been in this career for so long and I've been through so many... Uh, syllabi uh, exercises within Delhi University as well. And uh, and I've learned tremendously. And I see the value now uh, far more than when I was an undergrad of having a more well-rounded undergraduate education. Primarily because we have to think of it as undergraduate education and not just an education which is serving just our discipline. So I entirely agree with you, uh, Rekha Sharma, ma'am. Uh, uh, this is something that every discipline needs to look at and look at very carefully. You know, it, the days when we could just say do maths and that's enough is not enough anymore. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for the response. Anyone else would like, would like to ask anything, please? Okay, so I think now we are... Good morning, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, ma'am. Um, good morning, Arushi. Um, good morning, ma'am. First of all, I'd like to thank you for such an amazing presentation. It was very much learning. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, 
uh, basically i'm not having any kind of questions because it was uh, almost very much explanatory in itself um, i just want to have a small request that uh, just uh, how you explained right now that uh, in our national education policy 2020 the main motto or you know main motive of ours is to make the mathematics more interactive or playful for students correct so uh, can you suggest some ways or can you help with that ki, uh, how we can make that more interactive or more playful for the student for yeah. school students especially absolutely absolutely i mean in fact if you if you look at uh, this is again something that i have thought about for a while if you talk to primary school children right little children first standard second standard children no one will tell they will not say they hate maths they, they, you may ask them what their favorite subject is and they will say they'll come up with all kinds of subjects and they really will not say you know i dislike maths or hate maths but the same thing after middle school just ask children uh they, there is a deep feeling of fear towards mathematics that ends up getting developed and they're very happy to uh, leave mathematics after the 10th grade. And even getting through the 9th and 10th grade mathematics becomes a huge, uh, it, it's, it, it actually, you know, there's something called math phobia that often gets uh, developed. And uh, see, so as people who are, who love maths and who see the beauty of maths, we really do have to improve the experiences of people with mathematics, particularly at the middle school level. Um, I think what's been done um, uh, and a lot of work has gone on into this, which is, uh, you know, they've brought in maths labs. So the idea is that you, you do maths and you learn maths. Do maths with your hands, literally. Do maths by simulating on the computer. Uh, do maths by being out in the open and seeing how uh, things that you're learning in your school curriculum has a way in which you can look at things around you. In fact, there are experiments being done across the world um, to use the kind of maths that you learn at the school class level and use it to, say, examine government spending, you know. Uh, so there are lots of interesting experiments, experiences that are going in, and I think it we would do very well to bring in all of that. Um, also, there is, I know, a lot of work going on within math education in India on um, how to bring in everyday learning that students have on the streets, on uh, in local communities, into mainstream curriculum, right? So these are all things which will make the mathematics that they learn less alien to students. Uh, another area which you can really um, spend time on is things like symmetry. Because not only will it bring symmetry and geometry particularly, I think, because it allows students to think about mathematics in a much deeper way without creating the fear that mathematics engenders sometimes in them. But having said that, uh, mathematics is also a discipline which does require you to engage deeply with it. If you don't engage deeply with it, uh, you become um, less fast at doing things and unfortunately our learnings go through examination systems and if you're struggling with your multiplication tables you're not going to be able to calculate you know denominators of fractions you're not going to be able to manipulate algebraic expressions and that creates a cascading effect in students so apart from getting them to have an intuitive feel about mathematics through different methods. We also have to, uh, we cannot give up on 
the regular work that needs to be put in, but it needs to become more engaging and more fun for the students to do. I think if we if we do that and if we bring in those changes, and the only way we can bring in changes is by training our teachers. Without that, nothing that we do will be of any use, right? Because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to make the maths classroom fun or, uh, you know, uh, and a good experience. So to all maths teachers, please keep this in mind. Uh, don't scare away our children from, you know, continuing and doing mathematics. Yes. I hope that answers your question, Arushi. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyone else has to ask something or we can move to the next speaker? Very good morning, ma'am. Uh, firstly, very uh, your lecture is so enjoyable, and uh, I'm uh, so happy to uh, see all these uh, things and understanding the new things from you. Uh, I have a one question, ma'am. Yeah, please. Uh, how to improve the critical thinking in uh, the children? Uh, because uh, so many children are. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, focusing on rot learning and giving the exam and get yeah. the higher marks. So how to improve the critical thinking uh, in that uh, children's and uh, how to improve the education, uh, Indian education system? Yeah, so I think uh, Anjali, you hit the nail on the head as far as rote learning is concerned. See, um, I mean, so if you memorize something without understanding it, that's what constitutes rote learning. And uh, But why is it that students do rote learning? They're doing rote learning because our, the questions that we ask them in our examinations and in assessments uh, can be answered by rote learning. So I think the fault... The reason why rote learning works is because we have allowed it to work. So one of the most important things, uh, and this is something that I will say, even from my experience at the undergraduate level in, in across so many years, there is a tendency uh, for teachers as well to um, solve, to, to have a set of questions to solve those questions and provide the answers to the students and to then say ki exam mein ini mein se questions aayenge. You know, so, so what tends to happen because of that is uh, someone can just learn those answers by rote and do quite well in the examination. And uh, on the surface, then the teacher has also done well because so many students have done extremely well in that examination. So one of the key places where we have to intervene and change is the way in which we examine our students. And I think there the idea of a formative assessment should help in removing growth learning because we want to have a system which allows, which also goes along with the learner, right? To, to help them realize where they're going wrong in their thinking and to, you know, improve that. So one is our assessment patterns have to change. And we also have to allow our students time to think about the concepts that they have learned, allow them to have a freewheeling discussion on it, allow them to look at patterns from what they have learned and come to maybe... We have the other talk today. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sir. Sure, sir. I'm going to start. It is supposed to start 11.15. Can I have some time now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So now I, I, yeah. I am very right dear. <laughs> Sorry, sir. We just start. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll end up the question answer session now because yeah. our next yeah. speaker is there. And sorry, oh. Professor Kanad, for uh, eating into your time, but I think they will extend your time. Yeah. Uh, no, sir. You will have uh, enough time. So now I invite Professor Kanad Biswas uh, from IIT Delhi uh, on the topic, uh, the mathematics of machine learning and deep learning. So please, sir, welcome you.
Thank you, Dr. Pavan uh, My talk is not going to be as interesting as Giza's talks no, because I am going to talk about something really mathematics. See, today's world, I mean, everybody is talking about artificial intelligence. Everybody is using it, people in industry are using it, people in colleges. They are all students are all using artificial intelligence for their work, and uh, it's so easy to work in artificial intelligence because all the software is already available on the net. You just pull it something from somewhere, plug in the data, and you get the results, and you can show the wonders of artificial intelligence. My idea here, on request of Shubhankar Biswas, was to present some mathematics which goes behind it, you know, so actually you know how things happen. How does the artificial intelligence actually captures data and works out wonders from here? So at the cost of being boring, let me start my talk. Okay, mathematics for machine learning and deep learning. These are the two words that you hear as buzzwords for artificial intelligence. <clears throat> so what is it? It is an attempt to build a learning system which imitates human learning. So what is human learning? Human brain composed of large number of highly interconnected elements called neurons, which work in unison to solve specific problems here. How do you solve the problems when presented with number of examples? So it's learning from examples, actually. So here is one of the neurons here. And you can see that inputs are the read and writes on the left-hand side. And the output is the axon, through which axon output goes. And what is inside is the processor, actually, the cell body. And uh, there are such synapses like this about, you know, 10,000, 100,000 synapses are there in the brain, which keep on working and uh, trying to solve the problems around us. So what is learning? Learning is adjustments to synaptic connections because the inputs is not just direct input coming from other neurons here, but each of these neurons, uh, sorry, inputs are weighted. Depending on how much success they gave in the past, you increase the weight of the inputs. And when the sum of all the inputs going to a particular neuron exceeds a certain threshold, then the neuron discharges and sends a spike through the axon here. It goes to the next neuron in line. And so on, it goes on. Some of the weights may be positive, some may be zero, some may be even negative. Depends on, say, you had a bad experience, the weights for that particular inputs are going to be negative for you. So learning is based on how many times the correct decision was made, the importance of the weights of various inputs get modified here. We do the same thing on the machine now. On the computer, we create an artificial neural network which models the human brain and consists of a number of artificial neurons here. It also learns by example, and we can apply in various areas like pattern recognition, data classification to a learning process here. The model is similar to the human neuron. Each neuron receives a number of inputs. Each input given a weight and summed up. And then it goes through an activation function, which produces the output. So <clears throat> we have a number of inputs, x1 to xj, xm. And we have corresponding weights for that, W1 to WM. And we have an adder function, which sums up the inputs here. OK, then this is passed through an activation function to generate the output. Use the summation. And B is a small bias function here. Depending on the uh, situation, you change, keep on changing your bias. But in fact, this can also be thought of one of the weights with input 1. 
If the output exceeds the threshold, final output is 1. That means the neuron is fired. Otherwise, the input is 0. Here you can see a model in pictorial form here. You can see the input values x1 to xm, each given a weight w1 to wm with the bias b. It is summed up and then the output of the summation is fed through an activation function and it produces an output y here. So let g be the summation wixi and then we <coughs> have a very simplified problem in which we have got only two inputs here x1 and x2 and w0 serves here as the bias here. So if you solve the equation gx equal to 0 then we get equation of a line x2 in terms of x1. You can see the line on the right hand side here and you can see that now this line is able to divide the set of data points with us in class A and class B. So this is a simple binary classification problem and the job of the neural network is to learn this line because you don't know initially where the, how the line is going to be. So we start with a randomly placed line and keep on shifting it depending on whether the output was good or bad. So that's what we do now next. We start with the arbitrary chosen line. Depending on the input weights, the neural network may show incorrect output. That means weights are not proper. System needs to learn. So learning neural network is nothing but learning new weights so that the line clearly separates the two classes here. Sign is important of the GX. Magnitude is also important because the magnitude of GX tells us how far the input X lies from the decision surface very far, then it's fine, it's either class A or class B, but when it comes closer, then you will decide, you know, where it is going to be. So we create a vector X, capital X, which is a subset of all misclassified training instances here. And we then come up with the criterion function, J, which is summation of WAXI, summed over all the misclassified inputs. Next. Okay. So it is WIXI vector summation here. Now, if we want all inputs to be classified correctly, that means the system should not make any mistakes. This can happen only when JW is zero. Okay. So if JW is zero. <coughs> so before going there, we let's rewrite again JW as W x and minus x because when you have a absolute term you know, that needs to be modified in two separate categories here. So we operate in one way if x is misclassified as a negative example, x is misclassified as a positive example. Means when it should have fired and when it should not have fired, it makes a mistake. In either case, you need to take into account that. Now how do you solve this problem? We solve it through steepest gradient method. We take gradient of JW with respect to the weight and then set it to zero. So here you can see in the bottom gradient del J which is with respect to W <coughs> here X and minus X. So if this neuron makes a mistake you add the gradient to the previous weight here. Now if you just add it directly then the system may swing one end to the other end here and it may not converge very fast here. To do that, we include a eta, a learning factor, whose value is between 0.3 to 0.6 typically here, which lets us slowly change the weights of the system here so that it finally converges to some place here. And keep on iterating in the direction of the gradient until JW is equal to zero or very, very small. Then you can say, yes, we have learned enough whatever it could do from the given set of data points is the best thing that can be done. Now, this is a simple model. Only thing is limited that it can handle only linearly separable classes here. But in the real world, your things may not be so nice here. Now, you can see here, this line here, you can see two classes here. 
A, which is shown by small circles here, and B, which is shown by small star values here. So, given a new point now, we can figure out if the function is greater than zero, then it belongs to class A, and if it's less than zero, then it belongs to B. Okay. Simple as that. So once you know the line, after that, the decision by the neural network is going to be excellent here. It can tell any point very clearly. But in the real world problems, may not fall into this category here. Like it could be not like left side diagram here, but it could be something like in the right side. Here. The points can be like anywhere. They can, one class can, you know, sort of overlap the other class here. There are various situations like this one. In the left hand side, you see uh, a small set of circles being enclosed by another class, which are all squares here, but there's no linear separation here. You cannot even think of a linear separation here. So what do you do? Your new network model we just saw will not work here. So also in the case of the right hand side here. To solve the non-separable classes, we need to add more thinking. That means more layers of neurons between the input and output layers. This we call as hidden layers, because they're not visible to us, but they have to work themselves to carry out internal representations here. And how do you train this network now? By a new algorithm called the back propagation algorithm here. So what can it compute? Simple answer is anything. Given sufficient time and enough data, your multi-layer network will try to compute any function here. The major problem is learning here. This thing. The next must learn their own representation because we cannot program them by hand. It's very impossible. Okay, so we take a specific situation. Here, the input at the bottom, x1, x2, x3, x4, xa. And uh, we have included one more input you can see with the value one, which can act as a bias for the system here. And we have an output units at the very top, O1, O2, up to OC. And in between, we got a hidden layer also. So H1, H2, H3, HB here. And you can see that every neuron from input is connected to every neuron in the hidden layer. And every neuron in the hidden layer is connected to every neuron in the output layer. And the connections you see between them, they represent, each one represents one single weight. So learning here means updating all these weights based on the <coughs> outputs. <coughs> the error between the desired outputs and the actual output is that we want to minimize, and that is what we propagate back. And based on this, we update the weights. <coughs> so we have two categories of weights here. Between the input and hidden unit, we call them as W1. And between hidden unit and the output unit, we name them as W2. So learning, we know what it's learning now. What is learning here? Back progression algorithms such as for weight values to minimize the total mean squared error between input, uh, sorry, between the actual output and the desired output or the set of 10 examples here. So we have two passes here. First pass, we apply the input and let it go to the output and create the error. In the backward pass, that error is propagated back from the output layer to the hidden layer and ultimately to the input layer here. And this is done by recursively computing the local gradient of each neuron here. So you can see the green line are the forward layer. Obtain it. <coughs> and uh, when there's an error produced at the output, we feed it back to the dashed line going back. Here. Now, recollect the weights are adjusted based on the derivative function, gradient. Now, if we use a step function, like 
either pass or fail for a neuron, it will not work because it is neither continuous nor it is differentiable here. So we find a better choice to use a sigmoid function here. In segment function, we provide the smooth uh, between uh, distance between uh, no and yes, and it is not only really continuous but also differentiable here. You can see the function here goes between zero and one, like previous one, but it's a gradual change. So this is our sigmoid function, one by one plus e to minus s, and we can differentiate it. Which you can see it produces a product like this, but this can be written very neatly into another very nice form here. You can see that this can be uh, adjusted, terms are adjusted, and you can write simply as fs into 1 minus fs here. So we've got a very simple formula to compute the gradient here. And gradient is available because the function is continuous function here. So now, we can start with our machine learning issue. We take the data set, divide in two parts here, training set and testing set here. So in the training set, we'll provide to the input output patterns, number of times to the system till it stabilizes. Then we can use our testing set to find out how much it is learned. And initially we also uh, make a small choice about the learning rate here. And it has to come from experience and the particular problem at hand here. It's not very crucial. So now actually we go through the maths for this purpose here. We take the same network here, A nodes in the input layer, B nodes in the hidden layer, and C nodes in the output layer here. And also one more node has been added to take care of the bias value here. So now, <clears throat> how does the uh, forward path work? You have the input xi, and you multiply each xi with its corresponding weight, wi, and then we sum it up, and let's call this summation s1 here. This sum is pushed through a sigmoid function to generate the output of hidden layer, so you can see that hi at any point is equal to 1 by 1 plus e to power si here, where s is summation coming from all the inputs. So all the inputs from the lower layer have contributed to produce one output at one of the hidden layers here. Same thing happens for all the hidden layer inputs here. Now, all the inputs are hidden layer again, similarly are combined up, are summed up at any output layer, so it's W2 into HI, and this sum is pushed through another sigmoid function to generate the output of the ANM. So OI is the output of this particular neural network, one by one plus is to here. Now we produce something out of the neural network, but we match with whatever we wanted at the output. Is it coming? Same thing, if it is fine, that means weights are excellent. If not, we have to find the error. So that's what we do now. We uh, <coughs> compute the error, y i minus j, y, and then we square it up. And then we're going, to, we're going to sum it up for all the neurons here. And this is going to be our error function here, which you want to propagate back. And based on which we are going to compute our weights again. This is the error. And uh, we do the weight updation in two stages. First, we'll consider the weights between the hidden layer and the output layer. And then we compute the gradient of error with respect to the weights and use it for updation here. So this is what you're doing here. So this is the line that you see here at the output layer. We got the desired output and actual output. We take the difference and the difference is going moving backwards now to the hidden layers here. Back propagation algorithm is an approximate steeper descent algorithm here, which performs uh, performs index in the mean squared error here. Now we have to find the derivatives here. 
the error with respect to the weights here. So how do you do it? We use it through chain rule of calculus. Our, we want to find the derivative or the gradient of the error with respect to W2 between the output layer and the middle layer, hidden layer. Now that turns out to be equal to del E by del O, the actual output, del O by del S2, the summation, and summation del S2 by del W2, actual weight parameters here. Now, you can see the actual terms on the right hand side here. So let's start with the first term, del E by del O. And the error term can be ex expanded now as this term here. And we take derivative with respect to O. So the first term is the ability to yi square can be neglected. And the remaining two terms are abbreviated as this follows here. So that's why we took the half in the beginning here so that this two and this two can get canceled here for numerator and denominator. And you get minus yi minus y here as the first term on this chain group here. Other two terms, now del oj by del s, which is nothing but the function that you see on the right hand side top, y equal to one by this the <coughs> sigmoid function. So we know what is the derivative of this one. This is equal to fs into one minus fs. And here it gives oj to one minus oj here. Last term, del s2 by del w2, simple summation here. So just derivation that with respect to W, when you differentiate, you get only H there that you include it here. So you can see the three terms put down here, minus Yi, minus Oj, into Oj, into one minus Oj, into Hi. Now this is our gradient and our new change in the weight is going to be the eta into this term, this gradient here, okay? so. To every W2, we do the same thing and we compute the new weight from there. The derivation now moves from the uh, to the other state, which is from hidden units to the output units. Sorry, hidden units to the input units now. Came back here. So it stays slightly more involved. Earlier we had only one, one output only from each one of them. Here you get multiple outputs coming up from hidden units here. So, but derivation can move in the same manner here. And again, you can compute W1 in the same manner here. So, a simple calculus we go through that. And we go through similar steps here. And we get the updated gradients as this follows here. So this is the gradient of error with respect to W1 now, based on which we're going to update our set of weights W1 here. So once both W2 and W1 are updated, we are in a better position than before. But we could do better because initially we started with random weights. So we don't know whether we've done the best thing or not. So again, we apply our set of training inputs to this neutral network with the new weights which you learn of W1 and W2. And we update it again. And we keep on updating till we are satisfied that our criterion is met and our error has gone down to smallest value possible. Or the weights have stabilized, either of the two. So we start with a random values of the weights between minus 0.1 and 0.1. We don't take all the weights to be zero in the beginning because it's zero, then we will not be able to get it, we will not be able to update the weights here. Our threshold units are always activated to one, one value only for both the groups. And we choose an input output pair, xi and yi. That for this xi, we want this yi. Assign the activation levels to the input units, propagate the activation from units to the hidden layer and find to the output layer. And then you set the learning rate. These values say 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. Adjust the weight between the input layer and the hidden layer and repeat. When the input output pairs have been given to the network, we say one epoch has been completed. And keep on doing again and again, you know. 
So we say about 500 epochs are done, and then we say, oh, we have learned enough. When you have 50,000 epochs, the too many epochs may result in overtraining here. That means the system does a rote learning, you know. If you give the same inputs, it will exactly give you the same output here. But given a new input, it may or may not give the correct result here. So it is also we learn by trial and error because we don't know how, I mean, how few epochs you should give. So that if you give too few epochs, then system uh, doesn't learn very well here. You know? So to stop at some point here. Two layer networks with segment function in the hidden layer and linear transfer function in the output layer can approximate virtually any function of interest to any degree of accuracy here. Provided sufficiently many hidden units are available, number one. And number two, you have chosen the proper set of inputs X to the system here. Okay. <clears throat> The classes are not separable, then you would learn a little more. And so you have to use more layers in the hidden parts here. So you can see the blue ones are the available to us, input and output layers here, which you can measure. And in between, we got other layers of neurons, which serve to learn the internal representations here properly. And on the crisscross line that you see are the weights. Now, suppose we take a problem. We say, OK, um, given a set of tomato leaves here, can you find out which leaf came from a healthy plant and which leaf came from a diseased plant? And then also, you want to know not only healthy and not healthy, but also you want to know which disease is affecting the particular plant, you know, so that you can have proper treatment for that. But the question is, given this leaf, you cannot wave it in front of the neural network and say, okay, do something on this one. You have to get some parameters from here so that you can give it to neural networks here. So what are X and Y and Y in this case? From the image, we extract some relevant values. These are termed features in machine learning terminology and serve as XI here. YI are the output classes. Like in the previous example, you can see that only that image C is healthy and remaining all are non-healthy plants here. So the number of things you can see here, the 10 classes are there in this case, in all. This is the YI. XI. XI, XI this is the XI here. And these are the features that we use here uh, using image processing. We don't have to go into details of this one here, but the idea is you can use local binary pattern, color histogram, U moment, textured values, various things we can pick up from that image and give it as input to our machine learning neural network model so that it produces an output and says, okay, it is healthy, it is not healthy, it is disease, this disease is affecting that, and so on here. That will be the outputs. Yi in this case. We take another situation. Let's say we want to uh, recognize painted characters here. So maybe we take um, various parameters here, like counting black pixels in a vertical direction, how many are there in horizontal direction here, what is the detection of strokes, number of state lines, presence or absence of curves, total number of internal holes. These are some, some of the parameters which can be used to serve as XI for our system. Once we know proper XI for any practical problem, we can solve the problem of machine learning here. Weights will be learned by system, but XI you have to choose, and that's very critical. Suppose you want to do speech recognition. We take phonemes in the speech recognition. We have sound lengths, ratio of noises, filtering matches, Relative power, frequency spectrum, these are the parameters. So each domain will present its own set of features which you must know beforehand. So if everything is known, 
very few things could be done using our neural network model there. And also people saw that if you get too many features, the system tends to get confused here. So the, because the system, we didn't know what are the best features for that. Maybe we figured out there are 20 features for a particular problem. But when we try to solve it, we find the system not able to convert because there's so many parameters that are coming out in the system here. So we should have got the best set of features. Maybe the best set of features in that case only seven but we're using 20. So which are the best seven features? Again, somebody has to figure out that part here. So people spend a lot of time on this one here. Our company resources also was not very good 20, 30 years back. So people have been using machine learning techniques by using the best possible features available to them. Then we found that this remaining features which is best possible features we could find by using more hidden layers also. There is an example. So using more hidden layers, we could extract more internal representation of a system here. And that's what gave rise to what is known as deep learning here. So here's a deep learning model. <clears throat> so a deep learning model means adding more hidden layers into the system. And you can see the complications here. The complication here is number of weights. They keep on increasing exponentially. I need to solve for each one of them. Because unless you know the optimal values, in this case, you cannot be sure that you're getting the proper output of this from this neural network model here. So when the number of hidden layers is very large, we can call it deep learning, the combination of unsupervised it's supervised learning. Supervised so learning because we are telling it that for this exercise, it should be the Y here. Unsupervised means it automatically learns what should be the features required for to solve this particular problem here. But more important thing to know here is that deep learning will be successful only when data set is very large. If you just show four or five examples to a system, the system is not going to learn as with human beings, you know. You give more number of training examples, more known problems to be solved, then your capacity to solve a new problem increases. And this was possible because our computing resources became suddenly very large here and we had very nice hardware system to run huge systems from that. So deep learning algorithms seek to exploit the unknown structure in the input distribution here in order to discover Good representations often at multiple levels with higher level and features defined in terms of the lower level features. So feature to feature till it reaches the output here. So for example, a simple situation here, we present the system a number of faces and we want to recognize this face. So the very basic is the input at the input level, an image is nothing but a set of pixels here. So from the pixels and picture elements, the dots that you see, each dot carries some particular value. Now using this as the input, at the first hidden layer, we expect the system to produce some edges. State edges, curved edges, okay? Direction of the edges we should know at this point and also the magnitude of the edges also. At this next hidden layer, we expect that we come up with object parts here, eyes, nose, mouth, etc. here. And then finally at the top, then we want to come up with faces, build up all these faces here. And then we finally, we can do the recognition part at the part here. So all these internal parts that you see are hidden layer and uh, the size of the you know, network is much more than before here. And this is what is now we can be generally call as ANN here, artificial neural network with large number of hidden layers. Yeah. Now, when we talk about features, we are having an example before us here. It is handwritten characters here. Printed characters is a bit more easy because exactly you know that every time you look at the character, it will be exactly the same thing. But when humans write the characters, you know, they've got their own peculiarities, as you can see from here. So now 
given this model to a artificial neural network, what features you might expect a good deep learning model to learn from there? Maybe it wants to figure out, does the digit have vertical lines? One, four, nine, seven. They should have some vertical lines at least to some point here. Does it have some horizontal lines? <clears throat> does it have some curves or small circles? So it wants to find these features here. We also do without our uh, what's called thinking about it. Automatically, we do this thinking to figure out is it a five or a six or a nine. We try to do the same thing by our neural network model here. So deep learning helps us much better than machine learning. But thing is that very large number of weights parameters to compute. And this computation actually can go on not only hour or so, but can go for over a day or a week to learn the parameters for a neural network model here. Second problem, I mean, that we have here is what is called vanishing gradients. Because, you know, the weight updation is done by gradient choice. But if gradient is vanished, then how can you update your weights, you know? Then, where is the object located? Is it rotated? Then system will not be able to learn properly. If size is small, then also it creates a problem here. So let's look at one of the problems here. It's called the vanishing gradient problem. And uh, the new function is induced, which is called the ReLU function here. The gradient value keeps on decreasing as it moves back. The error may be so small that by the time it reaches the layers closer to the input of the model, that it may have very little effect. So this problem is referred to as the vanishing gradients problem. Let's look at this problem. <coughs> So you can see uh, a very simple model, but each contain a single neuron here. And uh, <clears throat> the final output is at the right hand side, C. So first we update the weight W4 with the gradient of the error between the, the output. Then that gradient again used to update the weight 4 and use that is used further to update the weight W3. Another gradient is computed. Now this gradient will depend on the previous gradient here. Okay. So this next gradient, by the time it comes to W1, you can see that the error has reduced so much. I mean, the gradient value is so small, there's not able to update the W1 properly from here. Okay. Because you can see that W2, WV1, the effect that the output change, any change in the output will have on B1, you can see from delta B1, is product of so many terms here. Each term is less than one. In fact, less than one by four, in fact, here. Sigmas that you see here, they are sigmoid functions, and we're taking derivative of sigmoid function at each point here. Okay, so overall, it's going to be very, very small term here, let's see, which will prevent us from updating the weights properly here. This is a sigmoid function. When it is a derivative, there is like this one here. Okay. And you can see the derivative is for a very small range here. The value is almost less than 1 by 4 here. You can see the maximum value that you can have is 0.25 here. And the values are mostly less than that here. So if you product of so many 0.25s here, actually the value is going to be very small here. The maximum value sigmoid derivative is less than 1 by 4. And so each term is less than one four. So when we take product as terms, the final value is going to decrease exponentially here. So the error may be so small that by the time it reaches the layers close to the input of the model, it may have very little effect here. So this sigma function is not very good when you come to deep learning networks here because the weights do not get updated properly here. So they came up, um, we tried can you increase W and do it, you know? But again, 
the value of the cement function is ultimately going to be limited no matter what value w you take from there. Okay. <clears throat> so we want a back propagation uh, we need a activation function that looks and acts like a linear function. Because you take the derivative seen that the value keeps on decreasing. We don't want the value to be decreased so fast here. So look for another activation function. We started with the step function. We went to the sigmoid function. And now we are looking at a different function altogether to serve as our activation function here. So the activation function needed, it looks like, acts like a linear function, but in fact a nonlinear function allowing complex relationship in the data to be learned here. Okay. This is the function that we are talking about here. It's called a ReLU function. What is ReLU? Rectified linear unit. You can see it's linear on the action side. What is rectified? Like a rectifier, it doesn't allow any negative values to propagate here. So any negative values are there, the output is zero. It's not do anything to that. So positive action it takes and it does allows it to pass it through here. So this nonlinearity is used in our system and it's found that ReLU function performs very well. And in fact, it helps to converge the weights very fast here. So this is what is used mostly now in deep learning models here. Derivative also very easy to compute as it's simply the slope and it's trivial to implement. It just requires a max function between zero and the value itself here. That is how you implement it, okay? So no matter how large your neural network is, you can very easily use a delu function in that. <coughs> Then comes the today's world, which uses what is called a convolution neural network. So we're very happy with the artificial neural networks, but we found a lot of difficulties with the artificial neural networks, ANNs. First of all, too many weights to compute. Secondly, if you just make a small shift in the image, you have to change the weights again. Because the system is looking at something different now. I'll give an example to you. Here, look at this A. Suppose there is a slice broken in between, or the size is small, or it is slightly rotated. Every image is a new image for the neural network. It's learned this thing all over again here. Now, to a human being, all these are A. Because human being does something else. It doesn't do pistol by pistol. Thing, it does something else altogether, and that is what is done by the convolution networks here. So again, we see the pedals of the ANN here, too many simply parameters here. So the, we start by cutting down the weights between the input layer and the first hidden layer itself here. So you can see that the image is 200, 200, how many, and many hidden layers, how many weights are there, you know. Okay. So, we don't have a difficulty in recognizing digits, alphabets, objects, even if it is shifted, rotated, or with size difference. Can you do the same thing? You know, how does our brain handle so many pieces of information that you have a large image, small image, people recognize it's a face, it's a pen, it's a phone, it's a shoe. You know, you can do it. Even though it is in any position, rotated, shifted, small size, big size, we are able to recognize them properly from here. There is something else going on in our brain here. So I give a very simple example. I say, identify an image containing a building given three images from here. So you may say, it is, well, it's the middle image. What's so great about it? But think a machine trying to do the same thing. What is it special in this image which tells us it is a building and that the first and the third image are not building here. Well, you may explain it anyways, but the thing is that no attribution neural network can be learned, uh, can be used to learn what a building looks like here. You know, because a building can take any shapes. It can be single story, it can be multiple story, it can, you know, present from different angle here. But what is so common between these images, which yet so look so different? 
the main thing in all the images is that they all are built up of straight lines, vertical, horizontal, or even at an angle here. But they are all lines here. See. Very few curved portions are there in this case. That is the most attacking point here. And we don't have to say that there are 10 vertical lines or 20 horizontal lines. No. A large collection of horizontal and vertical lines will sufficiently point it that it could be a building here. That's what we want from here. So ANN will not be able to do this job ever because each image is different. It learns different things from there. Shape, size, you know, angles, number of points in corners. They are all different. So now... <clears throat> Even if you give 100 different images or buildings to ANN, it will be very difficult to spot a new building here. So what is we do now here? We figure out the number of stages in this one here. How do you do it? We use what is called a convolution filter. What is a convolution filter? Like we am showing you a small 3 by 3 small filter at the bottom. So what we do, we take a portion of the image of the same size and do a dot product of that image with the given filter here. The corresponding point get multiplied and you add up everything. That is the output from there. How is it useful? Take this image on the left hand side. You can see that it represents an edge. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 values are there on the left side. And on the right hand side, you have 0, 0, 0 here. So it represents an edge present in the system. We apply this convolution filter on that. 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1 here. We take 3 by 3 part of the image and then place our filter on that and get the output from there. So where is 10, 10, 10? It will produce a 0 output because there are equal number of 1s and minus 1 in our filter. So it will produce a 0 output. You can see 0 outputs on the final output on the right hand side here. And wherever there is an edge present, it will produce some output because some parts are 1 and minus 1s are not same. So it will produce some output from there. Ignore the signs for the moment. See, for the moment, positive and negative values here. So just signs will be there. Values are there. Wherever there is an edge present in the system here. This is one example. Similarly, we have filters for horizontal edges, filter for diagonal edges, and so on here. So edge determination is very easy. Similarly, we have filters for detection of corners, curves, etc. here. We place this convolution filter on the image and multiply the cosmic values of the filter element and the image pixel, store the sum in the central pixel, and we get a new image from there. That is our first layer. We might have more layers like this in the system here, and we can find out so many information from this and serve this serve as our internal features for us here, which are used again for this one. So that's what it does. I mean convolutions neural network does is that number of parameters reduce considerably because we don't have one-to-one -one connection between the first layer and the input layer and we just do one convolution same just you saw three by three filter means nine parameters only nine parameters we have to do instead of computing all the weights between that we had earlier between the input layer and the first layer here and we can try a number of filters like this. In some situation, we don't know which filter may be useful. So system learns from there. Given large number of data values, it tries to learn the necessary filters from there. And use it again. When you give a test example, it will produce that better that time here. OK. So now you can see here how much information is really needed for this identification of this bird, let us say. Like I say that. I take out 50% information from here. You think it will be, your system will be able to learn? You may say no. 25%, you may say yes, possibly. If I take out 75% information from here, you will say system is never going to learn from there. Okay, so let's have a relook at this image. Suppose this image consists of vertical and horizontal lines only. I take away all the alternate horizontal lines. If we do that, my image will go down by 50% here. <clears throat> okay. Now, in the horizontal lines, 
Now I remove all the alternate vertical lines from here. Lines are so small in size that taking out a line from here will not cause any disruption to your thinking. You won't be able to even notice that the lines have disappeared from the system here. So if you do that process, I mean 50% you take another line, um, set of lines outside, which means you reduce the image to 25% of the size, till the image still remains the same thing here. Okay. So in the right hand side image, we have taken out the alternate vertical lines, alternate horizontal lines. The size is reduced to 25% of the original size here, and still you can see it's the same bird here. If you give this job to an artificial neural network, it will fail. It will not be able to do the job properly from here. But if you give it to a CNN, it has to only figure out where the curves are there, what colors were used here, what are the combination of colors. Everything is same in both the images here. And that information is picked up by CNN properly here. Okay. So maybe I can end my talk here at this point because I'm running out of time now. I try to give you a very uh, simple mathematical basis for our networks. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah, very. Uh, there were some questions from some Bala Subramaniam and this thing. Can we address those? Sure. Uh, 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 Dr. Pawan, do you have his uh, this thing there? Uh, no, he, uh, he actually uh, yeah, in the chat box maybe I think what he was saying. Yeah, uh, it was a very interesting and very nicely presented and you have really explained the power of mathematics sir which is uh, because uh, the professor Gita has explained how to get into mathematics now you have explained how <laughs> important to have great good mathematicians who understand all this <laughs> so it's great challenge for the universities to produce both good mathematicians as well as those who <laughs> When, uh, what is more interesting, I could see in the slides that uh, to yeah. learn, I mean, deep learning or machine learning, we do not need much of core mathematics. Only I think that partial differential equations or some calculus, right? Uh, basic courses are needed, right? And some background of programming languages. That's all I need here. <laughs> and very nicely you have explained that very simple way, and that was both the uh, other aspect of that uh, technical aspect and uh, mathematics part of it. Sir. I'm sure that. I mean, uh, students would definitely yeah. love to. It will definitely help the students to understand that uh, the mathematics of that is uh, for the deep learning. So we are quite delightful, sir, to have you. Yeah. So now I just uh, invite uh, Dr. Aswa, uh, that Vishwas, to present formal word of thanks. Yes. So before the next minute, uh, Professor yeah. uh, Director School of Sciences has interested to, to uh, share. Uh, I mean, a special thanks to you all, Sophia, yeah. to you for it. So uh, now, uh, Dr. Vishwas will give a Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I, want to, I want to thank uh, Dr. Kanan Vishwas, sir. It was a very nice presentation. What I have understood that after designing the neural network, we are basically uh, uh, training the network with some uh, uh, known data useful. As large as our data set is, the training will be that much good, I think. And then we are testing it with some unknown data. That means the output is unknown, but the input is known. Am I right, sir? Yes, that, that's the way so, Yeah, so uh, when, when we are training, we know as, as this our output is known, the, we know what is the error and how we can modify the weight function. But when we are testing it, how the system is measuring the uh, errors, I think uh, I, there I am having some problem to understand is how the system is identified and identify the errors in in a cnn in cnn in deep learning so i have seen uh, add you have explained that uh, there are lots of restrictions even if we, if we slightly change the inputs the system find is very difficult to get a meaningful output. okay let me just <laughs> explain by yeah. you take a book of mathematics the book of mathematics will contain many examples that is our training system, training part. At the end of the chapter, there are exercises. That is our testing part here. So you do you look at an example, you do it on the paper and check is going all right or not, you know, 
Then you say, okay, I've learned this part. Then you go to exercise part, and then you do an exercise, and you figure out whether okay. you've been able, you've produced, you've put the correct result, you've learned already something, you know. So exactly the same way it happens. The system doesn't know whether you're giving a training sample or a testing sample to it, it'll give you some output from there, and automatically it will feedback. So the user is not doing any feedback. Feedback oh. is done automatically by that system. So whether training examples or testing examples, system behaves in the same manner. It's the same system. Okay. That's right. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, sir, for your nice presentation. Or uh, now, let's. Uh, uh, sir, uh, which softwares uh, would you suggest for this, uh, like implementing back propagation algorithm and other algorithms related to uh, neural networks, like other than MATLAB, because you know it's not available on open source. So, which softwares can uh, we recommend to our students, which is available open source? Yes, there are a lot of things that are available are on things. the internet. People who do Python programming, they can do this. So a little bit of Python programming is very useful in this case. So you don't have to go even to the difficult part of C programming. People simple learn Python programming is very easy to learn. Nowadays they are te teaching Python in schools also. So yeah. that if you learn, I mean, then it's very there. Open source available, are available actually. This thing. And uh, one can get that with any computer science department, you know, where people are working and uh, get to more about this one. It's not so difficult to pursue. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir. Once again, uh, now let's start the formal vote of thanks. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, our esteemed speakers present with us today on this grand occasion, Professor Gita Venkat Raman, ma'am, and emit us Professor Kanan Biswas sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Nagasha Rao, sir, respected director, ma'am, Professor Minal Mishra, and all our esteemed dignitaries and colleagues. It is such an honor for me to get the opportunity to propose vote of thanks to all the dignitaries present in this webinar on the 136th birth anniversary of great Indian mathematician uh, Srinivasa Ramanujan on the event of National Mathematics Day. On the behalf of Mathematics Discipline School of Sciences, IGNU, we feel proud to extend a warm welcome to all the dignitaries attending this online webinar. We would like to express our deepest sense of gratitude to both the esteemed speakers, Professor Geeta Venkatraman, ma'am, and imitators, Professor Kanan Biswas, sir, for gracing the occasion with their redundant presence and genuine contribution to make this webinar a success. We trust that everyone present here must have immensely benefited from the same. We would like to wholeheartedly extend our sincere gratitude to Honorable Chairperson Professor Nagashar Rao Sir for his guidance and leadership and sparing time from his extremely busy schedule to grace this event of national pride. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your inspirational and encouraging words on this important day with us, like always. We would like to extend a special gratitude to respected Professor Nilam Misra, ma'am, Director, School of Science, for providing all the necessary administrative and academic support to make this webinar a success. We also extend our sincere gratitude to respected Professor Shochi Shah, ma'am, Director, Center for Online Education, IGNU, for live broadcast of this prestigious event on YouTube and Facebook Live. I would also like to thank all the faculty members and office staff of SOS for rendering voluntary service to make this webinar a success. Once again, thank you very much to each of the esteemed dignitaries for making it a success. Thank you very much for being with us. Have a pleasant day. I think. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, yeah. So, thank you all. Thank you. So, with the permission of uh, director, can we end the meeting? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all, please. Thank you.